Don't you just love it when a murder happens in your backyard and nobody knows who did it? I'm Aiden Mattis and welcome back to the now heavily armed War Lodge. Fox Chase is a neighborhood in northeastern Philadelphia, which I was led to believe as a college student was a very dangerous place to be. Who led me to believe this? My college ex-girlfriend, who wanted to seem more thug than she really was. When I actually went down to Fox Chase, it's a pretty nice area. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's middle class, but it's, it's not like, you know, the hood. Now, the neighborhood does, in fact, border on two counties, Montgomery and Bucks, while remaining within Philadelphia County. And in recent years, it's become a lot more bustling than it was back in 1957. In 1957, it was still a rather rural area, you know, very, very suburban, more like you would see, you know, out in Chester County, Pennsylvania now. Now, of course, this might mean nothing to people not from Philadelphia, but to people from Philadelphia, the case of the boy in the box actually means quite a bit. And that's because in February of 1957, something very strange was discovered. Across the street from a home for wayward girls known as the Good Shepherd, run by the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, the body of a young boy between four and six years old was found in a box, wrapped in a blanket, just sitting there on the side of the road. Now, there were a couple of people who discovered discovered it. On February 24th, 1957, an 18-year-old named John, who was a Polish immigrant, came across the body and didn't really know what to make of it. He convinced himself it was just a doll, and John, coming from, well, his parents particularly, coming from communist Poland, were very distrustful of authorities, so worried that he might not be able to talk his way out of the suspicion that it was his doing, he decided not to go to the police. But the next day, a man named Frederick, a 26-year-old undergrad student at LaSalle University, which is also in northern Philadelphia, came across that body. He claimed that the reason he pulled off the road was because he saw a rabbit run off into the woods and he wanted to look for it. And of course, John, the kid who found the body the day before, had been checking his illegal rabbit traps. There might be other reasons that Frederick stopped, but we won't really get into that. He, there were some accusations that he used to spend a little bit too much time looking over at the girls' school, and he was, for that reason, a little bit, you know, unwilling to go talk to the police. So what he did first was he went down to LaSalle, and he spoke to several of the priests, including his brother, and asked them what he should do. And of course, the priests told him, you, you really should go to the police. He said he was spurred to consider it more when he heard about the case of a missing girl from Belmar, New Jersey, just across the Delaware River. So, the next morning, a cold, rainy Tuesday, Officer Elmer Palmer pulled up to the location where the body was said to be. He pulled his patrol car up along the side of Susquehanna Road, stepped out, and walked into this little thicket of trees that used to be there. And upon gazing at the body in the box, it did not take Elmer long to determine that this was not a doll. And, somewhat ironically, the box was labeled Fragile Handle with care. Now, Elmer had not been there long studying the scene when a nun from Good Shepherd, seeing the police car outside, decided to go take a look at what was going on, and before Elmer could stop her, she got a look at the body of the young boy in that box and immediately turned away and began praying. Before long, a police captain, two detectives, and an ambulance were on the way to take a look at the body. When the ambulance actually arrived to take the body of the medical examiner, it became very clear the extent of the injuries to the body they just found in the box. He had bruises all over, a few lacerations, and just was generally in pretty bad shape, though he was intact. This was not a gory situation, it was just a very sad one. His hair had been cut, seemingly post-mortem, and he had seven noticeable scars. And three of those scars appeared surgical. The locations, of course, were two of them on the chest and groin, and one on his ankle. So, why were there surgical scars on his groin and ankle? We don't know. Chest, you can make some more assumptions, but the point of the matter is, there were signs that he had been cared for medically, but the state of his body did not seem to suggest the same thing. He also had irregular scars on his chest, elbow, and chin. Now, aside from the clearly visible injuries just looking at the boy, the medical examiner on autopsy was able to determine a few more things. First of all, most immediately obvious, was that the boy had been circumcised. He had three small moles on his face, one below his right ear, and one on his chest. There was also a single mole on his right arm. He had a full set of baby teeth and his tonsils were intact. Strangely, his right palm and both his feet felt wrinkled as if they had been sitting in water for a period of time. In his left eye, under the lights, you could see that there seemed to be fluorescent blue dye in his iris. Now this would suggest a diagnostic test, possibly for a chronic eye illness. Based on the state of the digestion of the baked beans that were in his stomach, it appeared that he had not eaten for two to three hours before his death. He also had a brown 
sludge coating his esophagus. Surprisingly, given the state of the body, he had never had any broken bones not at the time of death, nor at any point before that. And though the body was discovered first on the 24th of February, because it was so cold, mostly the 30s to 40s, it was a little difficult to determine when exactly he had died, because his body was being preserved more than it would in more temperate conditions. Nonetheless, detectives, the medical examiner, everybody got to work trying to identify whose body this was, and they thought that it would be a pretty easy task. The boy's face was completely intact, he was found in a large city where you could easily disperse photographs, so there was no reason to think that this was going to be a difficult case to solve. The crime appeared to be homicide, and in homicide cases, usually the perpetrator is known to the victim, and though they weren't positive, it was possible that there were other sorts of crimes committed, if you catch my drift. So the responding officers, Elmer Palmer and Sam Weinstein, were confident that they would pretty quickly have the identity of this boy, and once they had the identity of the boy, they would have their immediate list of suspects. Now, the first clue was the box itself. It was from Jason. JC Penny and it had contained a bassinet. In fact, they were even able to find the exact JC Penny at which the bassinet had been purchased. It was at 100 South 69th Street in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. Furthermore, they knew when the box had arrived at JC Penny and when it had been purchased. It had been delivered to the store around 1127, 1956, and then it was sold sometime between the 3rd of December and the 16th of February, 1957. Now, today this case would be open and shut. You'd know whose credit card was used to purchase the bassinet, and you would be able to quickly track that and find out who it was. But in 1957, credit cards were really in their infancy. The Diners Club cards had just started coming around. Even worse, because checks were unreliable, JCPenney had a cash-only policy. So there was really no way to track down who bought this specific bassinet. Despite being able to locate all of the bassinets, the FBI was unable to get any fingerprints from the box itself. So they couldn't tell if whoever had put the boy into the box had actually been one of the people who purchased a bassinet, or if they just found the box later. Fingerprints were taken from the boy himself, but because databases didn't exactly, you know, exist online, you had to manually go through and check this set of fingerprints against all the other sets of fingerprints on file, and even doing that, they didn't match anybody in the system. They also found a hat. It was a size 7 and 1 8 corduroy blue hat with a leather strap on the back. It was found just 17 feet away from the body, and it still contained the paper shape wrapping that usually goes inside of hats. It had been purchased and manufactured at Robin's Bald Eagle Hat and Cap Company at 2603 South 7th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So they went to check. They spoke to a Hannah Robbins, who told police that the man who had come in to purchase the hat seemed to be somewhere in his late 20s, that he was blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and that he was wearing worker's clothes. Oddly enough, the hat was also one of 12 that were made, but the person who purchased it requested that the strap and buckle on the back of it be added when he purchased it. Hannah also said that the man seemed to resemble the boy in the box's photograph, but it's hard to really say. As we know, the power of suggestion is a very real thing, and if somebody hands you a photograph and says, well, did the guy look like this, you're a little bit more inclined to remember that, yeah, the guy did look like that, unless he definitely didn't. Now, one problem here is that DNA analysis was a long way off. In fact, DNA itself had only been discovered a few years prior, the Watson and Crick experiments, of course, and they did not have a system for analyzing it yet. So you couldn't just take saliva, hair, you know, anything that they found on the body and compare it. They could do chemical testing to see if chemicals matched between people, but that was about it. They also found a cheap cotton flannel blanket, which had been cut into two uneven pieces. This blanket was wrapped around the boy when he was found. But again, they couldn't really figure anything out from this. It appeared it had been washed recently, and it was mass-produced either by Beacon Mills in North Carolina or Esmond Mills in Quebec. So this could have been a blanket purchased anywhere, any convenience store in the country, any general store, you could have bought this blanket, basically. You know, there was, there was no lead from that. There were some other clues found in the General Fox Chase vicinity that police considered, such as an adult handkerchief with the initial G on it, but chemical testing that handkerchief against the chemicals they found on the boy's body did not reveal any connection. They did also find a tan scarf and a size 4 flannel shirt, it was yellow, which was the correct size for the boy in the box, but they couldn't establish any link between those items and the body either. They were also able to find a set of clean black children's shoes, which were 
too large to be the boys, but those were also found on the other side of the road. Furthermore, there was a dead cat wrapped in a blanket that was found nearby, but chemical testing also revealed no link there. Now, what about the more in-depth tests of the boy's body itself? What kind of clues did those turn up? Well, in 1957, some interesting stuff. The medical examiner took tissue samples from all major organs and ran toxicology tests and found absolutely nothing. As I previously mentioned, there was a brown substance coating the esophagus, which indicates that the victim had thrown up shortly before dying. As I said before, they took fingerprints, but they didn't match anything at surrounding hospitals. They did find plenty of hair strands that seemed to just be clinging to the boy's body, and all of them, upon testing, were revealed to be the boy's own hair. Now, that did imply that he had much longer hair before he was, you know, put in the box, and they believed that the haircut was after he died. The presence of a complete set of baby teeth led Dr. Joseph Spellman, the medical examiner, to believe that the boy was under the age of six years old. He also noted the lack of dental work work or vaccination scars. I'm not sure necessarily what a vaccination scar is, but vaccines were a new thing in the 1950s, so maybe they did them differently and I just was not aware of that. But he had to ask himself the question, who cares enough for surgery but not to get a polio vaccine? Hoping to bring in a fresh set of eyes, Spellman's office contacted Dr. Wilton Krugman, a professor of anthropology at uh, the nearby Penn. For those of you who might not know, the University of Pennsylvania is one of the Ivy League schools. Now, why call in a professor of physical anthropology? Well, they tend to be very accustomed to human bones. Krugman determined that the boy's height, three feet and four to six inches, suggested that he was about three years and eight months old, but the body weight, which was 30 pounds, suggested an age of only two years, two months. This was determined by the two doctors to be the result of malnutrition. And then upon looking at his physical characteristics, they suggested Nordic, German, English, or Scottish ancestry. For those of you who know the identity of the boy before watching this video, yeah, we have the same questions. Authorities hoped that their initial investigation, looking into the wounds, the location, everything, that they would be able to determine the boy's identity and get this case over with nice and quick. And that was quickly proving to not be the case. So they went the extra mile. They took pictures of the boy's face, set him upright as he might have looked in life, and had the Philadelphia Inquirer print 400,000 copies of a flyer with information about the boy to send out with every gas bill in the city of Philadelphia. So to put that into perspective, basically every single person in the city of Philadelphia, except for those who were maybe still using coal to heat their homes, got a picture of this boy. It turned up a lot of leads. Fred Benonis, the guy who initially reported the body's location, was brought in for questioning and passed two lie detector tests. So they basically were like, all right, you're good. A Marine private first class named George Brumall saw the flyer upon returning home from deployment and felt it kind of resembled somebody. So he went to the morgue and said, yep, that looks like my eight-year-old brother. But while George had been away, his family had moved to the West Coast and brought that particular brother with them and and they were able to confirm that yes, that boy was alive and well in California. Another possibility that cropped up was a kid named Stephen Damon who had gone missing on Long Island in 1955. He was blonde, 38 inches tall, and 32 pounds when he disappeared. So there were enough similarities to consider it. So Philadelphia County and Nassau County exchanged footprints and things like that and determined that it was very unlikely that these were the same children. Despite a Herculean effort, the Philadelphia Police Department was unable to get any closer to identifying the body, let alone making an arrest. So with no concrete leads, both the police and the public started to piece together the clues and see what they could come up with. One of these tips led to a raid perpetrated by Montgomery County Police as well as Philadelphia Police in Horsham, Pennsylvania, which is about 7.6 miles northwest of Philadelphia. They went to a farm, rounded up four people, questioned all of them based on an anonymous tip, and all four were, of course, cleared because they probably had nothing to do with it. Another case of a missing child from Rhode Island was brought in, and in this case, it was a six-year-old and his mother who had left for Florida on February 19th, 1957, so about a week before the body was discovered, and had not turned up since. That child would have been six years old, blonde hair, about the same height, but about 10 pounds heavier. No connection could be established between the two children. Meanwhile, up in Manhattan, the body of a five-year-old girl turned up. 
Initially, police thought maybe these two could be connected, possibly even a serial killer, but upon further investigation, they couldn't establish a connection between this girl and the boy in the box either. At this point, a number of rather absurd leads were actually investigated, but it was becoming clear that the Philadelphia Police Department really was grasping at straws. But in the ensuing years, a much stronger theory was developed by a guy named Remington Bristow. Remington was obsessed with this case, and in a good way. He was actually genuinely trying to figure out what had happened, as the police department had kind of backed off and said, we don't really know what happened here. Remington worked in the medical examiner's office, and so had access to a bunch of records, and he had a theory. About 1.5 miles away from the body's location on Susquehanna Road, over on Morden Road, there was a foster home operated by Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti, and there lived an assortment of children, sometimes as low as five, sometimes as many as 25, as well as their 20-year-old, somewhat disabled daughter, Anna Marie Nagel, who was actually Catherine's daughter from a previous marriage and had no relation to Arthur. Now, that daughter, Anna Marie Nagel, had actually given birth to four children. Three of them were stillborn, and one tragically died in a, like, electric train accident at Macy's. I mean, I, I'm assuming it was Macy's. It, 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 was, it just said department store, but I, I don't know. I thought Macy's, knowing Philadelphia. But at the time of the discovery of the boy in the box, there were only eight kids at the foster home. Five girls and three boys. All of them were accounted for. Now, is it possible that there was a child there that wasn't on the books? Sure, but there was no evidence of that. So, after kind of just checking that out and looking at the circumstantial evidence, the police determined the Nicolettis probably weren't responsible. But then in 1961, Remington Bristow decided he was going to look outside the bounds of normal police work. So, he reached out to a psychic who lived up in northern New Jersey by the name of Florence. Florence Sternfield requested a piece of metal related to the boy, so Bristow presented two staples from the box. Now, Florence, who had never been to Philadelphia, according to her, told Remington that he should look for a large house with a wooden railing and a log cabin on the property. Now, it didn't take Bristow long upon looking through the neighborhood to realize that that matched the Nicoletti house perfectly. How could Florence possibly know that that house existed? That is anyone's guess. Maybe she actually had been to Philadelphia. Maybe she actually was psychic. But considering she was an older woman and she lived in Palisades Park, New Jersey, which is north of Manhattan, it's believable that she had never been to Philadelphia. So when Bristow searched all over Fox Chase and found a large stone house with a wooden railing and a log cabin in the back, he, he was pretty confident that this is what Florence was telling him to look for. And he ascertained that the children were allowed to stay in the log cabin in the summer where it was a little bit cooler and they would sleep on cots, have little slumber parties. So Bristow managed to arrange travel for Florence down to Philadelphia, brought her to Fox Chase to the site of the body, and then just kind of let her go and she walked straight to the foster home. Again, it's okay to be skeptical about this, maybe Bristow told her where it was, or again, maybe she actually was psychic. Of course by this point it was 1961 and the Nicoletti family had moved away and gotten out of the foster business entirely, which probably made Remington Bristow even more sure that they were connected to it because, you know, they did that right after the boy in the box was found. So what did he do? He went to a preview of the estate auction, and what he found in the basement was a bassinet that looked pretty similar to the one that would have been purchased at J.C. Penney. And then, outside on a clothesline, what did he find? Well, he found blankets that also matched the blanket wrapped around the boy in the box. So that's a box for what appeared to be the bassinet that was in the basement, and a blanket that was hanging on the clothesline, which definitely seems connected to the Nicolettis and the boy in the box, right? Uh, you can kind of see where he was drawing these conclusions. There was also a duck pond on the property, and you may recall that I mentioned that one of the boy's hands and both of his feet were pretty pruny, and Bristow thought, hmm, maybe when the boy died, he was somehow sitting in the water in such a way that his feet and this one hand would prune. For years, Bristow tried to get the police to follow up on his, his hypothesis, but they refused to do so. It was simply too much circumstantial evidence and no hard evidence. So at this point, the trail basically ran entirely cold. Despite all of their efforts and for, you know, their flaws of not looking into the Nicoletti case, the police did really try. Their decision not to investigate the Nicolettis does stand out as odd to me. Maybe somebody was paid off or maybe they really just thought it wasn't worth their time. I think they probably should have looked into it. But that didn't stop theories from rolling in, tips and clues and hints. Throughout the 1960s, they did receive minor clues, but one of them implicated a woman named Mrs. Martinez who was out in Colorado, and only because her case had slight similarities to what happened to the boy in the box, she had thrown a dead child into a dumpster. Not great, but not quite the same thing, and really far away to be connected. So, for two decades, there was really no movement until in 1984, 
Bristow was able to convince the Philadelphia Police Department to go and speak to the Nicolettis. Two homicide detectives ended up interviewing Arthur Nicoletti at his home in Dublin, Bucks County, but nothing incriminating turned up in that interview and they just dropped it, telling Bristow, I'm sorry, but there really doesn't seem to be anything here. Bristow was not really willing to take no for an answer and called Nicoletti himself. Remington asked Arthur to take a polygraph test, and Arthur declined to do so, which to Bristow was just even more evidence that something fishy was going on here, but as most of you probably know, polygraph tests are only about 60% accurate, and there was no positive outcome to Arthur Nicoletti taking that test. Best case scenario, he passed the polygraph test. Worst case scenario, the polygraph test was inaccurate and pegged him as lying, and then he had to talk to police even more. So you can't really blame Arthur for not wanting wanting to take the polygraph test. That's just good sense, really, whether he did it or not. It was a sensible decision on his part. At this point, he formulated a theory that perhaps the boy in the box was an illegitimate child of either Arthur Nicoletti or Anna Marie Nagel. That suspicion grew stronger when Catherine Nicoletti died and Arthur married his own stepdaughter. Bristow did not give up the chase and eventually, in 1988, he discovered that there was somebody rather important who had never been interviewed, the Nicoletti family doctor who treated all of the foster children. So he reached out to that doctor's wife, presumably because the doctor himself was dead, and the wife said that she had destroyed all of those records about five years earlier. You might think that's suspicious, but at the same time, it could just be that they were cleaning house and these were old records from kids who were well into adulthood now, and they just weren't necessary anymore. In the end, despite the bassinet, the blanket, the foster system, the house and cabin, the timing of their moves, suspicious behavior, and the psychic, Bristow was not able to come up with any concrete hard evidence. It was all circumstantial, and that was not enough to convince the police department to launch a full investigation of the Nicolettis. Still, when Bristow died in 1993, he was confident that he had pegged the right suspect. But with Bristow's death, the case kind of went cold, at least until March of 1998, when the Philadelphia Police Department, at this point the case being led by Detective Tom Augustine, who had been 11 when the Boy in the Box case actually happened and had carried a lifelong passion for it, accompanied by the Vidoc Society, which is a private investigatory society founded by several Philadelphia police officers, teamed up to try and figure out if they could reopen this case and get to the bottom of it with the new technology available. And one of the first things they did was file to exhume the body to take DNA samples. And they weren't able to get uh, nuclear DNA, which would be the best possible outcome, but they were able to gather some mitochondrial DNA, which is a little bit more difficult to use, but it can still give you some leads. The boy's identity was not discovered at this point, however, they were able to use that DNA to rule out that it was not Stephen Dammon. And with the case now receiving new attention, TV stations started to take interest, and not just local news. The television program America's Most Wanted ran a segment on it on October 3rd, 1998, and that brought in about 150 new tips. However, even with those tips, nothing came of it. At least, not immediately. Because a little bit later, they started to receive some very interesting information. On February 25th, 2000, the Philadelphia Police Department received a call from a Cincinnati-based psychiatrist. That psychiatrist said that one of his patients had called him in a panic early in the morning, before dawn, about a burden she just had been carrying for so long and she needed to finally tell the world. Initially, this woman was known as M and the book I used to do most of my research for this case refers to her as Mary. And that burden that she wanted to unload, not to her psychiatrist who had heard the story before, but to the Philadelphia Police Department, was about a murder that occurred in 1957 involving a young boy. So she asked the doctor to get into contact with the Philadelphia Police Department, and for months and months, they received letters giving bits and pieces of details about her childhood in Philadelphia, basically, you know, her providing them with the evidence that she, in fact, did know something about the case. Detectives Tom Augustine, who was the Philadelphia police detective actually assigned to the case, as well as detectives Joe McGillan and Bill Kelly, who were Vidoc Society members, basically found her letters believable, but at the same time, there was nothing in those letters that you couldn't get out of a travel magazine or watching TV programs about Philadelphia. So, in the meantime, as they had no real leads from this woman, they went and looked back at some other stuff. Augustine, thinking, you know, maybe Bristow actually was onto something, went back to reinvestigate the Nicoletti angle. Now, by this point, in the year 2000, Arthur Nicoletti was dead, but his daughter, stepdaughter, slash wife, Anna Marie 
Nagel Nicoletti, she was not dead. So Tom tracked her down. She was in a nursing home. He headed up to that Bucks County address, walked in, spoke to some of the patients there, you know, kind of made himself a presence, one that you might not notice, and then walked in to speak to Anna Marie Nagel Nicoletti. And he presented himself as perhaps a long lost relative, asking her, oh, do you remember me? And what he was hoping to do was snag a drop of saliva, a fallen strand of hair, a teardrop, something that might contain her DNA so he could test it against what they knew about the boy in the box. Before he could do that, a man in a suit, who he seemed, he believed was probably somebody important, walked in, asked who he was, what he was doing. He said, I'm Detective Tom Augustine with the Philadelphia Police Department. And he was told by this man, Anna Marie Nagel Nicoletti was not to speak to anybody without family present, which is odd because she was clearly old and probably suffering from dementia. So of course the question there is who were they trying to protect because it couldn't possibly be her. Tom, lacking a court order, really couldn't do anything and just left the building thinking, yeah, a court order would have been nice here. But around this time, they actually did get a break in the M theory. On March 23rd, 2002, they received a letter from M. The letter gave more detail than had ever been given before. It detailed the professions of her parents. Her father was a science teacher. Her mother was a librarian. And Kelly and McGillan were able to use this information to track down a neighbor who actually remembered that family right next to the house in which she claimed to have lived. She recalled that they were a pleasant couple, rather private, who lived next door for at least 40 years along with their little girl. A girl that she described as quiet but quite intelligent. So with this escalation in the M theory, all three of those detectives headed out to Cincinnati and they went to the psychiatrist's office. The psychiatrist acted as a mediator liaison between the two to make sure that M was comfortable and she told them a story. I would like to note that there's a little funny episode in the book where the detectives kind of find this guy to be, this, this psychiatrist to be pretty arrogant. Um, they mentioned how he used the term curriculum vitae and they were like, yeah, we all took Latin too, guy. Mary tells the detectives that she is actually a PhD chemist who works for a nearby office of a major pharmaceutical company and they positively cannot find out about this interview. The detectives say, they won't, we're keeping it anonymous, you know, don't worry about it, your, your job is safe. At this point, I went and looked up, you know, who could this be who has offices in Cincinnati, and what I found was J&J, &J, Teva, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, a number of other ones. I don't know when these offices opened, but this was in 2002, so it's believable that they could have been open at the time. I eventually did find out what company it was, but we'll get to that. At this point, I do need to drive home the point that in 2002, therapy was a little bit more of a taboo subject. It wasn't kind of how it is today, where pretty much everybody has some form of therapist and openly talks about mental health and all of that, and it's kind of accepted that everyone's got their own cocktail of mental health issues. In 2002, you didn't really tell people you went to therapy, and you absolutely didn't tell anybody that you were mentally ill. And then, M told the detectives about her childhood, and it is a ghastly story. She said her parents worked for Lower Marion School District, and Lower Marion is actually a high school that my high school played when I was there. This is this was a very weird case to research. She said that her parents were very well liked, charismatic, that they probably signed a thousand yearbooks. Behind closed doors, however, they were much different people. She claimed that her father molested her for years and her mother both encouraged and even sometimes took part in that because her father allowed her mother to indulge in her perversions, which were basically the same just with little boys instead of little girls. Now this does kind of track. One of the most common professions for pedophiles is public school faculty. It's one of the few places that you can be around children all day, all the time, and nobody questions you. Now, I am about to read you some, some stuff about this case and everything that happened. And for specifically M and her family, I have chosen to use their real names because I've looked into it and everybody involved is dead and none of them have remaining kids. So we're safe on this one. Later in this video, I will be talking about some people and I will be changing their names. So chasing this line that we know that M, that her mother was a librarian, her dad was a science teacher, and they both worked for Lower Marion School District, I was actually able to locate by pouring through yearbooks the identity of the only librarian at the school at that time in 1957. It was a woman named Marjorie F. Davis. And by looking through census records, I was able to confirm that yes, in fact, she did have a husband who was a high school physics teacher, James B. Davis, and they did have a daughter who would have been the right age to be M. And now we're gonna go into M's story and I'll get later into how we actually confirmed who M was and all of that and made sure that she was real, but we did. So M's story kind of goes as follows. 
when she was 13 years old, her mother put her in the car, drove her to another house. She wasn't paying too much attention, but she could tell that they were still in Philadelphia, though they drove for a while. And they pulled up to a house, and the house was described as, you know, all of these being close together, very close to the street. Her mother got out of the car, walked up to the door, a woman opened the door, holding a baby. Her mother handed the woman an envelope. She heard the man, a man inside say, did you get the money? Uh, the woman handed over the baby to Marjorie. Marjorie got back in the car and handed the baby to M. M described several things about the baby, like that it felt like he had a filled diaper and that he smelled bad, but you know, she didn't really mind because the baby was cute and all that. And that's, that's how they came to possess this child. It's important also to note that M claims that at this point in time, she did not realize how screwed up her family situation was, that most fathers don't assault their daughters and most mothers don't encourage that, and most people also don't purchase children from random strangers. And you might be asking, how is it possible she didn't know that? Well, it was the 1950s and people were a lot less open about their personal lives than they are today. Like, significantly less open. They're talking about, you know, that subject was completely taboo. So it's entirely possible that she really didn't know that this was wrong and that she didn't know how to handle it. When they arrived back at the house, her mother said the child could not stay upstairs and that he would have to live in the basement. And she brought down a thick cardboard box, some blankets, and a couple of dog dishes to serve as food trays. And that's where the boy was going to sleep, in an old coal bin in the back of the basement with a drain for a toilet. Meanwhile, M was not allowed to go down into the basement alone. She could go down when she was accompanying her mother, and she could interact with the child, but she wasn't allowed to do it alone. And she noted that when she talked to him, when she interacted with him, he didn't really interact back. He didn't speak to her, he didn't form sentences, he didn't really make sounds, he just kind of sat there unresponsive. This led M to believe that he was mentally handicapped. In fact, she says later in the interview that she doesn't remember him ever talking or even blabbering, really. M also mentions that about once a week, the boy would get a bath, which was necessary because he was living in an old coal bin and was constantly covered in coal dust, that his hair never really got cut, and that sometimes when her mother went down there to interact with the child, she was to feed him or something like that, uh, she was down there an oddly long period of time with what Mary had said about her parents' uh, sexual behaviors, we can only assume the worst. I know I just called her Mary, that's what the author of the book, David Stout, uh, referred to her as. M also says that she remembers going hungry as a child, that often she would have just barely enough food, and that her parents really didn't explain why they only had a little bit of money for food, considering that while teachers and librarians typically don't make tons of money, they should have been making enough money to feed their children. And she also said that they didn't really have normal family sit-down dinners, just somebody would make food and they'd eat when there was food. So the whole family dynamic was very strange, yet outwardly, everybody seemed to like her parents. That brings us to the night of the murder. M has referred to the child in this interview as Jonathan. She says that one night, when it was Jonathan's bath time, her mother went downstairs to get him, and based on a commotion she heard, it sounded like something had happened to upset her mother. She heard Jonathan's feet being bumped up and down the stairs on the way up, and that then she made him sit on the floor of the bathroom while she ran the bath, and M was ordered to trim his very dirty fingernails. Bath finished running, and she dunked the boy into the steaming hot water, which caused him to scream, and he was splashing around, which got her mother, Marjorie, wet, and at this point, Marjorie uh, screamed back at him until he went quiet. Either due to nerves or simply bad food, he ended up throwing up the baked beans they had eaten that night into the bath water, at which point Marjorie yanked him out and got very, very angry. She started slapping him over and over in the face until eventually he fell down and uh, hit his head pretty hard. And at this point, she started just wailing on him, punching him all over the torso and face until he no longer struggled and she screamed at M to get out of the bathroom. She says she then heard splashing as the boy was thrown back into the tub, and her mother telling the boy to wake up. Despite trying to stay awake to see what happened, she was rather traumatized and eventually just got too tired and fell asleep. The next morning, Jonathan was still in the bathtub, though the water had been drained and his hair had been cut sometime during the night. 
At this point, her mother wrapped the body in a flannel blanket and took her downstairs to the basement and out a side door into the driveway. This is actually a pretty common structural element in Fox Chase. The now 15-year-old Mary sat in the car with her mother with the body in the trunk, and they drove from Lower Marion to Fox Chase to Susquehanna Road, where she describes that there was a large church across the road and a thicket of trees, you know, where they were. Now, at this point in the story, Mary said something that was available on the internet, but did stick out. You see, Detective Kelly, who was one of the Vidoc Society members, was actually one of the original investigators of the case. And, at the time, he spoke to a witness, a good Samaritan, who, seeing a stopped car with the trunk open, and a middle-aged woman and an adolescent boy standing next to it, had offered to help them. But they never turned their faces towards him, and they simply were like, no, no, we're fine, you know, you can carry on. He had thought they were dumping something at first, and then he realized, oh, maybe they need to change a tire. He ended up just taking them at their word and leaving. Now, of course, they probably were dumping something. Now, what's important about this is the physical description of M from the detectives, because it occurred to Detective Kelly that what had been described as a 12 to 15 year old boy could have been the rather tall and unusually broad shouldered M, who, you know, at her now middle age, was tall and broad-shouldered and likely was the same way when she was 15. That's typically about the time that women physically mature. So it's entirely possible that 15-year-old Mary could have been mistaken for a 12 to 15-year-old boy. After the motorists had moved on, they took the body out of the trunk and serendipitously discovered that there was in fact already a box there. So that explains where the box came from. Perhaps it was the same box that had carried the bassinet that was in the Nicoletti household, and the Nicolettis had just dumped the box there. At this point, Mary's story kind of ends. It's a tragic story of child abuse, molestation, and probably soci sociopathic parents, but it does have an end, and... She goes on to say that her father eventually died, heart issues, and her mother died with dementia in an Ohio nursing home. She had moved her mother to Ohio when she got sick, and for the last several years that she knew her mother, she says her mother did not know her. At this point in my research, I also was skeptical about whether or not Mary had actually lived in the house. I decided I was going to track down her identity. So, I did just that. And I was able to confirm that Marjorie F. Davis was a real person, and that James B. Davis was a real person, used their census records, and conveniently, the 1950 census listed that they had a daughter named Martha E. Davis, born in 1944. Now, according to M, who is Martha, she worked for a major pharmaceutical company. A major pharmaceutical company that would have been somewhere near Cincinnati. Well, I was able to find an obituary for a Martha E. Davis, born in Philadelphia, who died in 2020 at the age of 76, meaning that she was born in 1944, who had multiple degrees, looked the way that this woman was described in the interview, and, most importantly, worked for Eli Lilly. Now, there, there, there are a few contradictions here that I'll get to, but I'm confident this is the right person. And once again, all of these people are dead, and none of them left behind children. There, there are no people connected to the Davis family who are implicated in any of this. So, I'm not defaming, I'm not trying to slander anybody, I'm just trying to show you that th these are factual details of the case that simply have not been revealed by the police yet. And I'm not the only person to come to this conclusion. I did find it in a few different message boards, but nothing with a ton of traction. So I'm pretty confident that this is the first time a rather large audience will be hearing this information. So the dates line up, the profession lines up, the places line up, and her psychiatrist confirmed that the story she told to the detectives is the same one he heard when she first opened up about it to him in 1989. Prior to that, it seems that he was one of the only people she had ever told about this, and probably the only person he, she had ever told in that degree of detail. Most importantly, she told that story in 1989, and the website, americasunknownchild.net, which actually compiled all of the information about the case, did not go online until 1998. So it's impossible, if her psychiatrist is telling the truth, that she got this information from the website. But of course, like I said, there are a few contradictions, a few mismatches. Those mismatches could be due to power of suggestion, it could be due to the amount of time that had elapsed, or even just to the officers not co correctly remembering what was said. Although it does appear that they recorded the interview portion, the actual story being told. Though, from the book, it seems like maybe they 
didn't record the part where she gave them the little bio of herself that she was a chemist for Eli Lilly and all of that stuff. For example, uh, David Stout's book claims that she had a PhD in chemistry. From what I can tell uh, from her obituary, her PhD was in acoustics and she had a Bachelor of Science in computer science as well as Bachelor of Science in speech pathology. It's possible that the obituary left out a doctorate in chemistry. It's possible that the detectives misremembered. What we know is that she did work for Eli Lilly, pharmaceutical company, that lines up. Her obituary does list James B. Davis, uh, 1899 to 1967, as her father, which lines up with the census records. She says that the boy's name was Jonathan, but as we know today, his name was actually Joseph. That could just be her you know, not having a perfect recollection. Jonathan and Joseph are close enough. They both have J-O. I, I would be inclined to say that either this was the author of the book changing the names for security purposes. Maybe he had stipulations that he had to change certain details in order to be granted the interviews. I don't know. But what I do know is Jonathan and Joseph, some, God, 50 almost years apart, close enough to say she's probably she's probably not lying. And this also seems to be a point where the police may have reached their own dead end. Who did they buy the boy from? Or was it a purchase or was it a reimbursement? How'd they get their hands on Joseph? Well, at the time, the police didn't know the identity of the boy in the box. It was 2002. Today, we know that it's Joseph Augustus Zarelli. And that allowed me to figure some things out, which I'll, I'll talk about later in the, uh, in, in the video. Now, Martha's account, and I highly encourage you to read it in the book, The Boy in the Box, which again, by David Stout, I'll probably link it on Amazon in the description here. The police were not convinced, or at least the active police. The Vidoc Society guys, they were willing to believe Martha, but Tom Augustine, who of course worked for the Philadelphia Police Department and was the lead detective assigned to the case, he needed more than just hearsay, more than circumstantial evidence. One spot where he was caught up was the lack of notes from the psychiatrist. Now, not all psychiatrists take notes, and even fewer probably keep them for 13 years. And he was a little confused about the situation with the acquisition of the child. Was this a payment or was it a reimbursement? And he's of course quoted as saying, if we could prove just one thing about it, we'd have it solved. And if we could disprove just one thing, we'd throw our tip in the garbage. So it's very clear that, you know, they were, they were struggling with this. And that's not a quote given immediately after this interview. That's a quote given later after more extensive investigations to try and corroborate her story. Now at this point in 2002, Lower Marion has been implicated. So so the Montgomery County District Attorney, Bruce Castor, decided to assign a few police officers, some from the county level and some from the Lower Marion Township level, to go and investigate the Lower Marion aspect of the case. For those who might not understand the term township, I know things like this vary from place to place. Pennsylvania breaks things down into counties, counties are broken down into townships or boroughs. Those are the municipal level of government. And then after that, you've got towns and villages, which typically do not have their own governmental structure aside from like a school district, but that's usually at the township level. Now to be very clear, DA Castor was definitely skeptical of the story. He fell more on the Augustine camp, but it was something they couldn't not investigate. Meanwhile, detectives Kelly and McGillan were very invested in Martha's story and they decided to try and track down her home. They did successfully find her house in Lower Marion and find neighbors that could corroborate that yes, in fact, that family did live there, but the neighbors also said that they had never seen a boy there. Now, of course, according to Martha, the boy had brought, been brought to the house at nighttime as a baby, had been kept in the basement basically the entire time except for baths, and when he died, they brought him out through a side door and then drove him several miles to Philadelphia. So it, it really is possible that nobody would have seen the child, and it's not like they had a finished basement. It's not like it was furnished a little hangout area. There was really no reason for visitors to the house to check out the basement. Also, they were finding that the people who actually knew the Davises said they were stand-up individuals, that they were just good old American as apple pie types. But of course, as we know, sociopaths are generally pretty good at masking it and charismatic and well-liked. It's entirely possible, it really is, that the outward reputation was very different from the reality. And throughout all of this, Augustine was asking himself, you know, why does Martha hate her parents so much? Well, if the story Martha told was true, it makes complete sense why she would hate her parents. They were assaulting her, they were torturing her and this little boy for years. 
But that wasn't the only thing that Kelly and McGillan managed to track down, because they did find Martha's college roommate. And when they asked her about all of this, she confirmed that, yeah, in college, Martha had told her that her mother murdered somebody. She dismissed it as, you know, silly, scary stories told in a college dorm room. But that was a pretty big boon to Martha's story. At the very least, the accusation that her mom killed this boy, if not the rest of the details. But what McGillan and Kelly could not do was get inside Martha's house, because the woman who lived there was very concerned that her 12-year-old daughter would be scared of the possibility that someone was murdered in their house. And this took a while. They started chasing down these leads in 2002, and it wasn't until autumn of 2003 that they finally were able to reach an agreement with the mother who owned that, or lived in that house, that they could come, but they had to be out of uniform, in unmarked cars, they couldn't tell the neighbors, it had to be discreet, they agreed. The three detectives, again, Augustine, McGillan, and Kelly, went, as well as two crime scene techs, and they had a look around the house. The bathroom had been renovated, the walls had been repainted, but in the basement, all three of them agreed, yeah, this looks like there was a coal bin down here, based on the construction of some rafters, and of course all of these and grew up in Philadelphia at around the same time that all this was going down, they would have known what all this looked like. They also noticed that there was newer concrete poured on a certain spot on the floor in a rectangular pattern, and that could possibly be covering up a drain. It would make sense. Why else would you pour concrete into a random part of the floor? In basically every possible way, that basement was exactly as Martha had described it. Augustine, despite being skeptical of the entire situation, did agree that it looked like there was probably a coal bin there, and this, this basement did match what Martha had described. But wouldn't it also match, like, any of the houses there? Perhaps most importantly, there was a side door exactly where she said there had been a side door leading out to the driveway. So, she must have at least had an intimate knowledge of the home, which indicates that she was telling the truth about growing up there, and possibly everything else. And this kind of leads us into most of the objections to Martha's story. They were things like, oh, well, she has a history of mental illness, but what mental illness is not specified, and it could well have just been anxiety, depression, something simple. It doesn't necessarily need to mean she was psychotic. And it seems unlikely that somebody with a serious mental disorder, schizophrenia, psychosis, something like that, would be able to succeed on their own to the level that she did. Multiple degrees, a PhD, research scientist at Eli Lilly, just does not seem possible that she could be both completely broken and mentally just off the wall nuts and also successful that way. Now, if we're talking like antisocial personality disorder, sure, but that still doesn't explain why she would make up this entire story. And again, if she's telling the truth, it makes sense that she would tell this story. It would be the right thing to do. Another issue is that friends and neighbors do claim that the Davis parents were upstanding citizens, that they were good people, they were well-liked. You know, there was no reason to suspect them of anything, but as we know, as true crime has become more and more popular, sociopaths are not always obviously sociopaths. Killers, abusers, pedophiles, they can all cover their tracks pretty well, and especially in the 1950s, where technology was so far behind what it is now. You didn't have Facebook, you didn't have Snapchat, you didn't even have a cell phone. Whatever went on inside your house, nobody was going to know about it unless you showed them, or somebody spoke up. And Martha, being 15 and likely scared of retribution, didn't speak up. And yet, despite there being no evidence that she lied, there's also only circumstantial evidence to suggest she told the truth. Because of this, the case remained open, and there was really no movement, and how could there be? Both of the Davises were dead. The only remaining person was Martha. So the police were left with an option. Either they say, we think this is what happened, case closed, and possibly let the real killer get off and condemn a perfectly normal family to eternal bad rep, bad reputation. I don't, I don't know where I was going with this terminology. But my point is, they probably looked at it and said, we just don't have enough evidence to say that we're certain about this and the ramifications could be too great. Meanwhile, the Nicoletti case had not been completely settled. In 2007, a warrant was issued for a DNA sample from Anna Marie Nagel Nicoletti, who at this point was barely lucid at all. Two Philadelphia County police detectives and one Bucks County police detective went to fulfill this order to take her DNA sample. And that test ended up confirming what was already suspected. Anna Marie Nagel Nicoletti had no DNA connections to the boy in the box. And from 2007 to 2022, there was essentially no public movement. 
in 2021, they actually did uncover the boy's identity, but they didn't release that until just last month, December of 2022. What they discovered was that the boy's name was Joseph Augustus Zarelli, that he'd been born in January 1953. And the way that that happened is some of the most 21st century stuff you're ever going to understand, because a man named Justin Thomas bought his then girlfriend a DNA test kit. She broke up with him, so he took it himself. And a little while later, that pinged something, this was in 2017, that pinged something in the system of Identifinder International, which is an organization that I suppose does this kind of thing. They said that his DNA was a partial match for a cold case in Philadelphia, but they would need more DNA to confirm it from his mother. So he walked his mother through the DNA test, she sent it in, and sometime later he got the text from his sister saying that the boy's name was Joseph Augustus Zarelli, and that was a name he recognized because his grandmother's family were Zarellis. Not only that, but the DNA test confirmed that his mother was likely a first cousin of Joseph Augustus Zarelli. So his maternal grandmother was a sibling of the parent of the boy in the box. And this is the point at which I'm going to stop using real names. Why am I not using real names? Because I've given you all of the names that are publicly available and... I would prefer to not, you know, accidentally defame anybody if I do turn out to be wrong. But as the title of this video suggests, I do think we may have solved this case. There is a Zarelli family in Philadelphia that involves five siblings, and all of them are within the correct generation to be Joseph Augustus's parents. One of those siblings, who we'll refer to as Meredith, she appears to be the grandmother of Justin Thomas. I know that because she has a daughter with the surname Thomas, and it just, it just works out, okay? Just trust me on this. I, you can do your own research. I'm not going to say the words because if I say the words, it opens me up to legal liability. But go ahead and do the research yourself if you want to. But I can confirm that, yes, this Zarelli sibling is definitely, almost certainly, the grandmother of Justin Thomas, who, again, is the only person who has been publicly named. So if Meredith Zarelli, as we're calling her, is Justin's grandmother, then Joseph's parent, whichever Zarelli it was, must be one of her four siblings. We'll call this, this one Jane. Jane Zarelli was born in 1922 and had one son. The next Zarelli that we'll call Kate was born in 1919 had one daughter. One of the two brothers of the family, we'll call him John, was born in 1926 and had three children, and he married in 1959. I was unable to get marriage dates for the two sisters. And the last one we'll call Dave Zarelli. He was born in 1928, and he had four children, and he was married in 1952. One little tidbit of information that the police did let out was that Joseph Augustus Sorelli has living half siblings on both sides, which is precisely why I'm changing names because I don't want to I don't want to be that guy who goes and causes a ruckus. If again, if you want to do the research we just did, all of this information is publicly available. I just don't want to, you know, cause trouble. But due to the fact that we know he has multiple half siblings, that rules out the other the two sisters. And, and of course, you know, Meredith who is the aunt. She, she's not involved. So that just leaves John, the older of the brothers, and Dave, the younger of the brothers. Both of them had multiple children, and both of them got married in the 1950s. If John is the father of Joseph Augustus Zarelli, then it's possible that Joseph was conceived out of wedlock, which explains why he only has half-siblings, and why he has half-siblings on his mother's side. That seems to probably be maybe genetic testing, or the police have his birth certificate. They know the names of these people. Like, they, they know who this is. It's just an active investigation, so they won't release the names yet until they actually know. They do have suspects and all that, they're just not public. Now, why would this be a likely scenario? Well, it's because John was not yet married when Joseph Augustus Sorelli was born in 1953. So it's possible that he had a girlfriend, they weren't too careful, ended up having a kid, gave the kid up for adoption, and it ended up in the hands of Marjorie Davis. Now, if it's Dave, a little bit more murky because he was married in 1952. So an out of wedlock child, a little bit more of an issue. Now, obviously out of wedlock child in 1950s in the first place, especially in an Italian Catholic family, not a great situation. Out of wedlock and the result of an affair, even worse situation. Or, you know, based on the, he got married in 1952, Joseph was born in 1953, in January of 1953, maybe this was their first child together and for some reason they weren't prepared to take care of it and rather than, you know, have an abortion, which was an incredibly dangerous and often illegal procedure at the time, they chose to give it up for adoption. But if so, why is the child not listed in any obituary? 
obituaries or census records. I, I mean, I, I get it. Like if he wasn't alive long enough to be involved in the census and I, I don't know, just the angle that it was John's kid makes a little bit more sense to me because they would explain why there's less records. But I'm pretty confident that the parent of Joseph Augustus Zarelli is either this John Zarelli or Dave Zarelli who again, I will not give you their names myself, but this is all publicly available information if you catch where I'm going. We'd initially filmed this segment when we filmed the rest of the video, and I'm sorry for the different location and the echoey audio, but we had to get this done out of the wire. I wanted to clarify the theory I have here because the one I presented was a little garbled and this is, this is a more streamlined version of it. The man that we're referring to in this video as John Zarelli is who I believe is Joseph Augustus Zarelli's father. I believe this because of some name similarities, some ages, and most importantly, because John was not married until 1959. And we know that Joseph Augustus Zarelli has living half-siblings on both sides, which means that his mother cannot have been the woman that John eventually married that woman who is the mother of all of John's recorded children. So what I believe happened is that John Zarelli had a child out of wedlock with a girlfriend because these two people were living together when Joseph Augustus Zarelli was supposedly bought by Marjorie Davis. I believe that because it was the 1950s and abortion was not yet legal in Pennsylvania and this was an Italian Catholic family, they decided to keep the child, have it, and that they likely stayed together for a couple of years. Because Joseph Augustus Zarelli was about two years old when he was picked up by the Davis family, I think what happened is that he was not developing at the rate that John Zarelli expected a child should. Autism was not well understood in the 1950s, and it's very likely that this child was somewhere on the spectrum due to the fact that we know from Martha's story that he was nonverbal. Of course, this is assuming that Martha's story is correct, but we have no other leads. Because the child was nonverbal and born out of wedlock, putting it into the foster system to be adopted would have likely been quite the process that two young people in the 1950s did not want to go through. I believe, rather charitably, that most likely they tried to give the child up to a loving home privately, that they maybe even accepted some recompense, some, some cash uh, for, for their efforts, for their burden, so to speak. Unfortunately, if I'm correct, that means they gave the child to Marjorie F. Davis, who went home with her husband, James B. Davis, and her daughter, Martha E. Davis, to that Lower Marion house where the story I told you that I relayed from Martha unfolded. At this point, with the child dead, I believe they dumped him on the side of Susquehanna Road, that that passing motorist did in fact see Marjorie F. Davis and Martha E. Davis standing next to that car. He claims he did not see their faces which is why it's possible that he was not, in fact, looking at a teenage boy, as he thought, but a broad-shouldered, tall teenage girl. Now, of course, the only people who can confirm or deny my theory on this are the Philadelphia police. They have Joseph Augustus Sorelli's birth certificate, and they know his mother's name. I may be correct, and based on the available public evidence, again, everything in this video is publicly available information. And if you want to go and look it up yourself, you can do so, and you can probably come to the same conclusion I did, find the same people I did, and if you want to, make your own theory, write your own story, make your own video, and, you know, put it out there to the world. But for the sake of ethics, we're choosing not to name these individuals. I'm sure that one day, the Philadelphia Police Department will eventually release the information, who they think the suspects were, and we will know whether or not we're right with this theory. But that could take a long time, because they may feel they need to wait until all of Joseph Augustus Sorelli's living siblings have passed on, so that nobody is immediately impacted or implicated by that announcement, should we be correct. Once again, I want to reiterate that it is not our intention to defame anybody or accuse people of things they did not do, but it does occur to us, not with the Zarellis necessarily, but part of the reason that we did in fact name James and Marjorie Davis is in case there was anyone else who was victimized by these people who feels they can't come forward, who feels that they were alone. We want you to know that as far as we can tell, you were not alone and, you know, your, your pain is valid. And as we said before, Marjorie, James, and Martha Davis have all passed on and there are no known living offspring of any of those people. We are, of course, just investigators, just YouTubers. We are not the police. And we hope that nobody takes our words as encouragement to harass anybody, 
cause problems or interfere in the investigation. We just want to give you the information that we have. With all of that said, I'm going to throw it back to the original version of this recorded video so that you can get the last of it and see the outro. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that story makes sense, and I hope that eventually the police will come out with a story that matches and I will be vindicated. If not, you know, at least we tried. But at the very least, we've given you the story of the boy in the box from start to finish. This was a grueling project. It involved me reading so many articles, pouring through census data, through yearbooks, uh, 30 pages of handwritten notes that I took. You know, we really hope that this was a good overview of the case. I do think it's worth noting that this video got pushed back like three weeks because we wanted to do this in December, but the more I dug in, the more I discovered that there were layers and layers and layers to this story. So it was a much more in-depth project. This was probably 40 to 50 hours of research. And you know, if this is a style of content that you like, if you like this depth, then we can keep doing it, but we need to know that it's something that's worth it. So let us know in the comments if you liked how this video turned out and if it's something that you think we're right about, let us know in the comments. If you think that we're wrong, let us know in the comments. If you really hate us, I don't know, uh, send us money or something, we'd hate that. But if you want to send us money because you like us, you can check us out on Patreon, which the link is in the description. We have subscriptions available for just $1 a month and you get access to all the exclusive content over there, which currently is not as much as we would like it to be, but there will be a new drunk folklore coming out and we hope to do one of those every month. We'll also post cocktail recipes and fun things that we do around the channel over there. And of course, you can check out the link tree or the card in the comments, whichever, or the description, whichever it is right now, I'm not entirely sure. And if you you want to support us and also get delicious beverages, you can check out Tableau Roasting Company. They have a link in our description for our coffee, Mount Pocono Perk. It is delicious. It is delectable. I love it. I designed it myself. So check that out. And uh, I think that just about covers everything. We also have merch. So like I said, if you want to support what we do, those are the best ways to do it. Once again, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lord. Line.